Can you guys hear me at the end? Good, good. If I drift a little bit and, and stay like, quiet, let me know. So uh, my name is Luciano. Uh, I work for IBM uh, on a group called CODATE, which stands for Center for Open Source Data and AI Technologies. Uh, I've been working uh, with IBM for uh, a, little, a little bit. Uh, have been working on open source for over 10 years. Uh, did a lot of like Apache stuff in the, in the past and more recently doing a lot of things with uh, the Jupyter ecosystem, working with notebooks, we created Enterprise Gateway, and we're working on other projects as well. Uh, if you need to contact me, have questions, or need slides, or any, uh, anything related to the talk or not, uh, here's all the information on how to contact me, uh, email, uh, Twitter, you can ping me on GitHub or, or LinkedIn, uh, feel free to Take a picture. I'm also going to put the, the slides available, so if you guys want later on. So, uh, just a very quick introduction. I, when I talk about uh, that I work at IBM, I think probably a lot of people know IBM, but we'll probably think about like maybe uh, proprietary software, like mainframes, and all of that. Uh, I just want to mention like we do a lot of open source. Uh, if we look into the project, uh, products and uh, services that we do today, I think pretty much all of those include at least some kind of like open source packaging, uh, and uh, we contribute a lot. Uh, the numbers I have here, like uh, over like 10k uh, commits per month, uh, that is probably much, much, much bigger now that we have acquired uh, Red Hat. So this this kind of stats is like prior to Red Hat acquire, acquirement. Uh, and, and not only that, I mean, as I'm today here, like we do a lot of like, we go talk with the community, try to do the bridge from like uh, uh, requirements coming from corporations and stuff. So it's very good to have a conversation, uh, be part of the community, uh, give back and all of that. Uh, what do we do in open source? So like a lot of like the projects that we build, like maybe coming from research and stuff, uh, particularly more recently, uh, even more on the AI uh, side, we have been kind of like a, starting to put those uh, into open source. We have a place where we kind of like, well, not necessarily incubation place, but like a, a place that it goes into like DeveloperWorks website called DeveloperWorks Code. Uh, a lot of like the projects get started there. And, and right after that, we start working with the community, building a community about, around that. And those start getting migrated to uh, maybe like uh, uh, open governance. Uh, some examples, yes, but not like just very, really like some examples like Node-RED. Open Whisky, which is now at, at Apache, System ML, uh, blockchain, and among others, and we keep always like bringing more and more uh, 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 projects into that place. Uh, in terms of community and contributions, I think uh, just some examples here. Uh, these are some of the strategic uh, communities that we have. Uh, not necessarily by any means only those. We 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 do across the board open source contributions and participation. Uh, we also have been teaching kind of like internal, like the IBMers, like how to uh, participate in, in, in open source, like what is the implication of like choosing licenses and all of those like very important information. Uh, we also uh, have made those available in open source, like in the developers website as well. And uh, last but not least, the, my group, uh, uh, Center for Open Source Data and AI Technologies, 100% uh, of what we do is uh, with the community's open source projects. Uh, we started a few years ago. Uh, we were originally called Spark Technology Center. Uh, we increased the scope uh, to go and do more AIs. So we still have like data as like all the contributions we do in analytics, in Spark, in that area. But we are now like doing a lot of like contributions on TensorFlow, uh, PyTorch, uh, Kubeflow, and and you name it. I mean, it's related to my group. Uh, IBM does a lot more uh, other than that. So I think you guys really want to know more and learn about like pipelines. So today, what we're going to talk in terms of that. Uh, little bit of like Jupyter notebooks as we kind of like just put everybody on the same page. Probably like a lot of the, a lot of you guys have played with notebooks in the past. Well, okay, a good a good percentage. Uh, so we can uh, uh, kind of like jump around some of those. Uh, talk about some of the analytics workloads, some of the scenarios, how you start putting things uh, into pipelines. That will touch base a little bit of like how we get things into productions as well. 
Uh, and then uh, when we move to more like deep learn workloads, they have kind of like a different set of requirements. Uh, uh, and we're just gonna see like a, how we build that in a different set of like environment and, and some of the tools and, and, and frameworks that are available in the market that we can use for those. Uh, so Jupyter Notebooks, uh, I think you guys are all familiar with that. Uh, it, it allows you to start putting like code, uh, documentation, narrative, all of that into one place. Uh, development is an interactive development, so you can focus and repeat like a specific cells and get going and going. Uh, but really like why Jupyter Notebook got so, so kind of like a interesting and, and everybody or, or a lot of the people already knows about that some of the characteristics that we see on the notebooks. So it's very simple and powerful. Uh, you can basically uh, bootstrap, go to the web page. If you're getting it as a service, even easier. You just hit a web page. Everything that you need to do development is there. Uh, it's interactive. You basically, you can request some data, start plotting that and, and, and getting kind of like visual details about the data. Uh, Data science, I mean, we know that not of the data science background, they come from like a, a computer science, they, they, they might come from different backgrounds, they might have different uh, uh, like skills in terms of like, or preferences in terms of languages. A lot of people like R, a lot of people like Python. Uh, data engineers might want this environment, but they like Scala or something else. Uh, Jupyter Notebooks provides all of that. Uh, the kernels give you a kind of like, eyes, isolation of the environment and you can select which one kind of like suits you better or you're more familiar with so you're more productive. Uh, for those doing analytics, uh, integration with big data is right there. Uh, there are uh, uh, like kernels that goes and talk to uh, Spark and very integrated with Spark. We saw Dask uh, presentation just before, uh, the one, bef two presentations before mine which we are basically describing like Desk and, 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 and giving some of the examples as well that you can be using uh, as, uh, in, in the notebooks. And once you kind of like have that, it's easy to just like maybe pack that uh, into a GitHub repository or just it's kind of like if you don't have a lot of like dependencies on that in terms of data, just ship into the, send via email, the notebook, everything is there. You can start sharing and collaborating with a couple of folks that you, you have. Uh, let's start now taking a look of like some of the workloads and how we can start actually building pipelines uh, uh, for some of those workloads and not necessarily having to kind of like go away from the notebook and just reuse the notebook. Uh, what do we see when we talk about analytics workloads? So like some of the characteristics here, uh, large amount of data, so you, you need a lot of like resources to, to be uh, processing those. Uh, usually those data is kind of like a, you have a, like a data lake or, or like an object storage where we have those data available. Uh, and some of the kind of like a workloads that you want to do, some of the tasks you want to do is start, start, start playing with the data, cleaning the data so that it's useful for you. Uh, you can maybe start doing some data warehouse, applying some uh, machine learning to get some insights. Um, so in th that kind of workload, like what are the things that we that we want to do when we are developing uh, some analytics workload. Um, usually what we see is people really want to start decomposing those, like processing data or maybe like cleaning the data uh, is one of the tasks that you need to do, but you don't need to do that very often. Uh, maybe you need to do when new data is coming or like initially, but then you can move to other parts of your development pipeline uh, and do interactive development, reusing that data that has been proce processed. So this kind of gives you, gives you a, a, an example of like a different stages that might consist pipelines and that you might have uh, a notebook that is performing or executing some of those. Uh, I think depending on preferences or different scenarios, this might be much bigger. This might be much smaller, so uh, you met, your mileage will vary, but it's just uh, as an example. Uh, and to kind of like concretely show you like what I'm talking about, uh, we're gonna uh, be using one scenario for this talk. And uh, just for folks, what I did is I kind of like create a scenario where I wanted to uh, collect some community stats from repositories and like, uh, that I, I, I kind of like follow. 
so I have a notebook that goes and collects statistics so, such as like uh, uh, forks, uh, stars, and a number of, number of contributors, creates a CSV. I have another notebook that goes into a specific repositories and see like uh, the amount of contributions that we are getting and who are the top contributors, for example. And then uh, that generates another CSV and I have an overview that basically gives me kind of like a visualization or something that is more consumable by, by, by me or by anyone that is kind of looking to that. So uh, very simple scenarios, just starting from kind of like early on. If what I'm doing is very simple and I don't need to like uh, have any big workflow, uh, there are some solutions that are very easy to implement. Um, so let's look into those and then I think uh, the second uh, part of the, uh, the talk, we're gonna look more into like frameworks such as Airflow and TensorFlow pipelines. So simple ways, uh, very simple, very easy to implement. If you're using uh, IPython, uh, IPython has a kind of like a run magic. Uh, you can basically use that run magic and say execute my uh, two other notebooks that are generating data and that will uh, execute those and then go and start uh, executing the next cells. So you do uh, have the uh, very first hello world pipeline in like two, three lines of code. Uh, everything else, the magic handles for you. Uh, some of the benefits is easy to use. Limitations, uh, very kind of like Python centric. So if you're doing R or doing something else, probably that is not gonna be available for you. It's a static, uh, you do that and that's all the thing you do. You don't have any flexibility to say, oh, only do this if, if maybe the data file is not generated yet or anything like that. There is no command line integration. So if you need to do some kind of like a, a, a uh, scheduling or integration with something else is a little bit more harder, but you get simplicity or you, you get more kind of like uh, capabilities. But that can give us a, a kind of like initial uh, step on doing that. And I'm gonna talk about a couple scenarios and then show it working, go back to kind of like a couple more scenarios, show it in a demo instead of like just one by one so that it it's kind of like takes more uh, time. Uh, another example, another tool that we have, and that starts giving a little bit more flexibility, it's uh, NB Convert. NB Convert is a tool on, uh, on the notebook side for, from, uh, created from Jupyter guys that uh, I think initially the main goal is to give you the ability to getting a notebook, convert that maybe to uh, HTML, uh, PDF, or you name it, uh, all the supported um, uh, outputs are available here, but I think it's extensible and you can create your own. But one of the uh, uh, ways uh, to convert those is by executing those notebooks. So you can start kind of like uh, piping those or, or putting together multiple notebooks uh, to generate a kind of like a pipeline that will give us kind of like a similar scenario with extra capabilities of uh, enabling us to convert the outputs maybe to something that we can easily share. Um, and also uh, sort of like a, giving us the command line uh, integration capabilities where we can start uh, maybe like uh, scheduling that with uh, uh, cron jobs and things like that. So it starts giving you a little bit more flexibility there. Uh, just as an example on how if you would use, so you can easily just do a pip install and be convert. If you're doing Anaconda, probably everything is already there. Uh, if, or if you just have notebook install, it's probably you have that there. Uh, and you can just say and be convert uh, to HTML, uh, and then the dash dash execute will force that notebook to get executed, uh, and you can just get the output as a, no uh, a, a notebook itself or uh, uh, in, into HTML or, or some other format that you need. Uh, so far so good? Okay. Uh, people who started using those were maybe like not so flexible, not so like in integratable into other solutions. Uh, and then a couple years ago, I think uh, Netflix uh, open source uh, paper mill. Have you guys heard or used the paper mill in the past? Okay, a couple of guys. So, Paper Mill sort of like starts getting you the ability to uh, execute uh, notebooks. 
starts getting you a little bit more flexibility, enabling you to like define and pass parameters. So you can actually uh, uh, run one notebook two, three times and say maybe uh, this is running on a dev environment, this is running on a production, or maybe you're um, trying to train a model and you pass a set of parameters to kind of like a, uh, control the, 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 the information you need to pass to that model during training. So it starts giving you that flexibility. Uh, the good thing is uh, it also has sort of like a, a uh, kind of like API, so you can start using that programmatically and integrating some other maybe uh, application or even other notebook or just your Python script, so that gives you more flexibility. Uh, you have access to kind of like generating multiple uh, runs, uh, multiple experiments with, with that, and starts also making it easy for, for scheduling. And I think that was sort of like a, a, a good step in the sense of like building pipelines because after we got that and after we got kind of like a programmatic API, we start seeing paper mill sort of like being the basis to a lot of like the next example that we're gonna talk about uh, where uh, it then was embedded into bigger workflow enabling you to run a notebook directly and get uh, uh, and don't have to kind of like have to uh, after you're done with notebook, transform that in like a Python script or something else to, to execute. Uh, so, so far so good. Just quick summary before we go to the demos. So what we, what we learned so far, running external notebooks uh, from within the notebook cells, uh, using paper mill APIs, and uh, kind of like being able to convert those and run and convert those to some other output that we need. Let's see how it really looks uh, kind of like uh, in action. Um. Is it big enough? People can see in the back? Go. So uh, if you guys wanna do it together or later on for reference, uh, everything is on my GitHub. <coughs> so uh, I just, using some of the GitLab, uh, so this is Git, GitLab, uh, if for those that are not familiar, uh, I just use the Git integration and I check out my uh, Git repository. The scenario that we talk about is inside pipelines folder. So uh, if I was doing, if I was going to do this kind of like manually, so I would have kind of like the, the stats here, uh, my contribution, and then I can have, let's say, my overview here. And I would go in and execute here. So run, run all cells, and you start seeing that uh, some CSV are gonna start popping up on the left. Uh, similar thing here, let me run. And then, uh, in this case, just manually, let me wait for those uh, CSVs. So the stats are there. Okay. And I can come here now to my overview and then just uh, run all cells. And I can see sort of like the, the, the kind of like more visualization, the, the repositories that I kind of follow, uh, some stats there, and uh, like uh, some of the contributions on other uh, repositories. Uh, as we saw like with the run, very simple, if we wanna automate that, uh, so I don't have to go and like run every single one of the uh, repositories, I can basically come here, you can see the run uh, uh, magic, and I'm just saying run these other notebooks for me. Very simple to implement, very easy, but not very flexible. Uh, similar, I can just go and say run. Uh, it will generate the data again, and I can get my uh, uh, kind of like overview here. So just taking a little bit time and yeah, we can see the uh, updates on the last modified basically being regenerated. And once those can kind of like have been implemented uh, or uh, run 
uh, you uh, execute the rest. Uh, one of the caveats as well is like, if you have big notebooks that are running, it's kind of like are gonna go in parallel, oh no, sorry, it's not gonna go in parallel, it's gonna be sequential, so uh, um, when you start using other frameworks that are gonna look into Airflow and, and Kubeflow pipelines, you get, you, you get the parallel, parallelism as well, so that uh, multiple notebooks can run in, uh, uh, in the same time. And similar thing with the uh, paper mill integration. Uh, now I can actually just, for example, use uh, the kind of like API. So I imported paper mill package and I can do execute notebook or uh, I can actually just shell and use the command line here um, and kind of get that. And then I use kind of like a, the uh, NB convert here to kind of like a execute the overview and uh, actually even output like an overview HTML for me. So let me uh, run those. And let's just wait. So got it. one of those got executed. The other is gonna be kind of like in a shell. You can see kind of like the percentage being executed here. And then right after that, we'll see kind of like the uh, uh, overview getting generated and we can actually use that. Okay, just executing. And we can see here that uh, we should have it. Yeah, we have the overview here, and this is kind of like a, a snapshot and it converted to HTML. You can get that, get the information, maybe ship by mail to your boss or some other people that is interested on that. So very easy, very useful, and you got kind of like a, a very uh, initial pipeline uh, implemented here. So going back to presentations, uh, so far good, so far so good. Any questions? Okay. Challenges here is. These are very good, very simple scenarios for us to get started, see how we can kind of like start getting those notebooks, reuse it, and sort of like more towards generating uh, uh, data. But in, when you're talking about enterprise, uh, the, the, this kind of like solution doesn't have really like a, a, a all the requirements that we need to build very big uh, workflows. And I'm talking to, I'm talking really something like that. I mean, it's like, a, tens of like uh, maybe all close to 100 or maybe sometime even more, kind of a different steps, uh, steps that needs to run in parallel, steps to maybe needs to kind of like only run if something else happened. Uh, how do you start doing that in a kind of like efficient way, but also plugging your notebooks, not having to transform that into like maybe a Python script or some other application? Uh, if we look into just like if we take the notebook picture uh, out of the, the out of the the, the question here, uh, we have seen uh, very kind of like frameworks that have been very uh, successful in the market. Uh, one is Apache Airflow. We have been, I mean, I think a lot of like the SciPy, Pi data and stuff. I, I see Airflow being mentioned. Uh, other type of like conferences as well. Uh, and when, what is Airflow? Airflow starts giving you kind of like a a way to programmatically, similar to kind of like how PaperMill had an API, uh, uh, Airflow has a kind of like workflow API that starts you, uh, lets you start building tasks kind of like based on operators to, to, to build your pipeline, to build your workflow and then execute those. Uh, so far so good, it, we, we see it handles very large workflows. How do we then uh, kind of like start, uh, start incorporating notebooks so we, the notebook can become part of that workflow? So I mentioned kind of like a, uh, the, 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 this notion of operator that I, I use it to build the, the DAG for, for the airflow. Uh, there is a uh, paper mill operator that allows you to start bringing a notebook as one of the steps of the airflow uh, uh, workflow and you specify then which is the notebook that you wanna run. You can start passing, for example, uh, parameters uh, and so forth, all the capabilities that, that uh, uh, paper mill gives you kind of like natively now it uh, enables you to just plug that 
as an operator into Airflow. And what we saw uh, in the example where we just run a notebook, now it can be running as part of the big Airflow workflow. So uh, that gives us much more flexibility, uh, much more powerful to integrate and decompose our notebooks and start reusing those uh, into like more enterprises uh, analytic pipelines. Um, and basically, uh, what we saw before in terms of the workflow, uh, now just notebooks are part of that. Just a quick summary on the first path here, what we saw for the analytics. So, uh, what like just kind of like a summary. So, like if you're looking to run, uh, the 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 uh, run magic is mostly Python and static. Uh, NB converter uh, uh, starts giving you a, a, a little bit more. Uh, in terms of like support for different kernels, uh, a little bit more dynamicity there. Uh, paper mill is kind of like giving you even more. Uh, gives you programmatic APIs, uh, enables you to start using notebook parameters. And with Airflow, you start then kind of like tackling the uh, enterprise scenario, being more uh, able to build heterogeneous pipeline workflows. Okay, so if no questions, I will start talking a little bit more of the uh, AI and deep learn workloads. Cool. Oh, yes. So uh, uh, if if you're using run and you you're running a notebook, the only way to ex execute something different, maybe another notebook or, or uh, with another parameter, you have to go to the no notebook and change that. Uh, once you start having a little bit more flexibility in terms of, let's say, a programmatic API, uh, you might have a cell that says, oh, if the file is not there, like the data file that you're looking for, then run this notebook that is going to generate that file. So you, you have more control without requiring to go back and update your notebook to, to give that flexibility to you. You're welcome. So, uh, have you guys been doing uh, deep learning and um, kind of like TensorFlow and other uh, APIs around? Okay, a few, but much less than the guys that are familiar with the notebooks. So, uh, to me, the main difference from like analytics to kind of like when you're doing uh, uh, deep learn is like analytics, maybe you're just processing a lot of data. Uh, most likely you will be using some kind of like API, but it's not very uh, complex environment in terms of like maintaining that environment. You don't need a lot of isolation. Uh, but when you start going uh, to uh, uh, deep learn workloads, uh, you need a lot of isolation. Why? If you look at, let's say, I work in a company that does TensorFlow. If you have four people Probably they are all in different versions of TensorFlow. Uh, they have different dependencies. They one require two GPUs, others don't. You have to really start isolating the environment to give flexibility for folks to do those. Um, and if you expand to the different frameworks, then you have uh, people are doing uh, Python, uh, R, uh, all of those different. And, and it's very hard to try to manage that in one environment. So uh, isolating that is much easier. Uh, types of like things that you do uh, also take a lot of time, like training. Um, sometimes like a very simple mini, it, it might take an hour. Uh, we have some models that we do that takes like a week to train. Uh, so it's complicated and, and you might not want to directly just do that interactively but you want to reuse the notebook. There are lots of like uh, different requirements that comes into play when you're, when you're talking about AI and deep learning workflows. Also, I really want to think uh, in the kind of like a persona of the data scientist. Uh, a lot of the things that we do today are to make that work, maybe like as we saw in some of the others, um, it involves a lot of like a DevOps type of things. And in, in the case of like a, uh, uh, doing AI model development, it's even worse. Uh, how you do research management, uh, how you handle configurations, uh, 
okay, I'm ready. I'm going to do serving, what I'm, what I'm going to use to serve, how do I scale that. Uh, oh, I'm still in training, uh, how I handle hyperparameters, uh, do monitoring, uh, reproducibility when, once that is kind of like ready. And if the data scientist, not every time comes from kind of like a CS background. And it's very hard to, for us to try to put that uh, burden into the data scientist. So some of the challenges, and I think I just mentioned a little uh, of those. So how do I isolate multiple environments, multiple frameworks? All the frameworks have different dependencies. Uh, how do I allocate and free up resources? Uh, uh, I, I might need to give GPUs for giving data scientists, not for others. Uh, more data, more memory. Uh, how easily to give those environments uh, for uh, the data science to do their workloads. So what we have seen here, um, it, containers gives you a lot of the iso isolation. Uh, Kubernetes came to kind of like do the management for those. Uh, it's, it allows you to start kind of like giving an environment as a flexible, flexible uh, thing in the sense of like I can say, oh, I, I need a, a Python kernel for my notebook, uh, but I'm doing TensorFlow, so give me that uh, in a TensorFlow image. Uh, then I can start kind of like uh, attaching to that uh, GPUs and only for the time that I'm using because that uh, pod is going to be kind of like giving away back uh, to the pool once I'm done with that execution. So that gives us a lot of like flexibility in terms of like the environment where to run. It still not solve all the kind of like DevOps stacks that, that, that we need to do. What we start seeing uh, to kind of like help on the DevOps and not necessarily help 100%, but they, they are trying to get there is then kind of like AI platforms. We have seen like a, a Kubeflow. Uh, uh, we as IBM, we have like Watson uh, machine learning as well. Uh, then there are others that are coming up in the market. Uh, these are all kind of like sort of like new, maybe a couple of years or uh, frameworks or platforms that are coming out and they really try to focus, well most of them and I think if not all are based on Kubernetes to leverage all the, those kind of things we discussed it and they try to kind of like remove some of the DevOps making it easier for uh, the developer that are building a model uh, to kind of like concentrate on, on building the model and not on the DevOps. Uh, Kubeflow, uh, basically then kind of like a ML to kit for Kubernetes, um, has been there for a couple of years, uh, try to help you there. But I think what really we want to talk about is uh, sort of like Kubeflow pipelines. And the Kubeflow pipelines uh, enable us to start kind of like defining those workflows that we need, but very centric to AI models. So you can have like a, a end-to-end -end orchestration, uh, it starts to do easy experimentation, so you define a pipeline, that pipeline can then run uh, multiple experiments with uh, different uh, parameters, uh, and it starts to be kind of like easy to reuse, because those pipelines then can be reused or attached to others. Uh, when we talk about pipelines, there are two things kind of like you need to know, like the pipeline in itself. Uh, we have a, a visual representation here, uh, that is sort of like backed by kind of like a YAML file that defines what kind of like each of these components or tasks uh, will need to do in the environment that needs to be uh, used. And each component, basically each task is a component. Um, and the isolation that we mentioned, the component is kind of like associated with a given image that uh, you need to do. Uh, those uh, Kubeflow pipelines, also have the notion of like the operators uh, and have kind of like a programmatic SDK or API similar to Airflow. So a lot of the concepts uh, are similar. Uh, I, my particular view, Airflow is more for analytics type of like scenarios. Um, Kubeflow pipelines, because of like the isolation uh, being run on top of Kubernetes give you more like a, the environment that you need for AI. And here uh, is sort of like the code that we need and kind of like uh, 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 the representation of the pipeline from the two notebooks that we are looking at. Um, let's take a look now, uh, maybe at, well, maybe I have a one more slide here, and then we can take a look at, at concretely how it works and then take a quick like view of like Kubeflow. 
So going back to the initial slide that we were looking to the pipelines uh, in AI and with Kubeflow pipelines, we start enabling maybe uh, sort of like different environments for different tasks that, that, tasks that we want. Uh, maybe I want to do model training with TensorFlow. Uh, I want a GPUs associated. Uh, model validation, I'll probably maybe let's say use TensorFlow as well. Uh, but Deployment, I'm going to use like a, a different uh, kind of like environment. I want to use uh, uh, native uh, Kubernetes, and what is it, Knative server. And uh, Python, maybe to just kind of like a do some uh, model testing uh, after the fact. So you start giving that and you can build up that all into uh, your pipeline uh, definition. So... Questions, I'm gonna hop into kind of like the example and that should give you a lot more. Let me just shut down the previous ones. Uh, so if you don't have like, let's say the environment uh, install uh, pip install KFP will give you kind of like what you need um, and I kind of like define here so uh, sort of like where in uh, object storage uh, notebooks and some of the resources that I need will be and then I start defining kind of like the uh, I, I kind of created a, a, a notebook operator to simplify and then the definition of the pipeline here with my um, defining that I want one uh, notebook to be running, and then uh, I define kind of like the the kind of like a after means the dependencies. So I want the uh, overview to run after the other two have already run, and then the SDK basically and say compile this pipeline, upload to the environment. So let's run this and see how what we're gonna get. So executing, uh, let me go now and show, uh, okay. Uh, so we can see kind of like a, the uh, pipeline that got created here, so like by the timestamp. Um, and uh, you can see the uh, kind of like each, each component here. Uh, you can see also like uh, in the back end is kind of like uh, uh, backed by a YAML file. And this is just the definition. You can click and then see kind of like arguments that is being passed. Uh, and experiments actually then uh, is where you're going to execute those pipelines. And um, the notebook that I submitted already kind of like created an experiment and a, a specific run for myself. Um, and we can see here some got already executed. And um, all the files are then being kind of like uploaded, the, the results to uh, object storage where you can see. And uh, at the end, you see those, you can go and then kind of like see the results uh, in, in object storage, uh, reuse those, or, or uh, in that case, I'm, I'm, I'm returning a version of, of a notebook that has been up, updated and also a uh, HTML uh, conversion. And we are sort of like running, uh, getting close to the time. So I'm just gonna give you uh, some of the resources and uh, open for questions. Uh, thank you very much for attending and any questions? Thank you, Luciano, very thank nice you. talk. Um, so one question, I guess I've, uh, you mentioned in the discussion of Kubeflow, the ability to sort of embed dependencies in your notebook. So I'm uh, just trying to wrap my head around this. Is it conceivable that I could use this to replace make files that you've been using make in, in a managing a project? Uh, so make, I'm not sure if I understand your scenario, but like for make I usually do, uh, and maybe I'm using it wrong, but like I usually maybe try to handle more like a, build type of like steps automation. Uh, this is trying to automate, 
to a certain extent, it's automation as well, but I can, it's more like the execution. So uh, you might be running one of the steps, which is a notebook that is doing training. Uh, that might take four or five hours uh, in that batch, uh, kind of like environment that Kubeflow provides you. So to a certain extent, it, it's kind of like the similar automation, but not necessarily to replace make, but make my might help you submit those uh, jobs, maybe, let's say, to Kubeflow or Kubeflow pipelines. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Another question here? Oh, sure. Thank you very much.